to we're going to look at the entire chapter Daniel chapter 2 I would have preached this Sunday morning Sunday night but brother Trask was with us this morning so and I, I want to do this together the second chapter and so we get two messages in one tonight okay and the saints of God said okay <laughs> the back side we have the outline that helps us so that you can uh, better follow along with me uh, don't give me that nonsense I know better than that hey hey my question is we got it recorded my que we had to redo, redo it the, the, my question is did you turn the power off yeah no it's on okay I'm just asking Daniel chapter 2 we'll continue our series in the book of Daniel uh, and so we're to the second chapter and for our opening reading we're going to go to verse 31 and just read the prophetic dream but we will begin at the beginning of the chapter and we will make our way through 49 verses without having to read all of them, okay? Because the primary part is the dream, uh, God-given dream to King Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation that Daniel gives him. That's the major part. And so we'll focus in on it. Verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heavens hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay that shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume 
all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath uh, made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. It's the prophetic dream we're calling the chapter. The prophetic dream. We're looking here in the second chapter. King Nebuchadnezzar really, really receives a dream from God. Uh, uh, he's dreaming a dream and the king doesn't understand it. So he calls in the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, the wise men uh, and advisors of his kingdom. And they cannot interpret uh, the dream either. So the, three, the, the king threatens to kill them if they don't come up with some answers. Young Daniel, he knows God and he hears from God and gives the interpretation of the king, dream to the king. So we have the dream and the interpretation. We've just read it in your hearing. Verse 31 through 45. And so the key verse of the second chapter are just those verses. They are a prophecy. There's a foretelling of the future and what the future holds. Particularly, it says that there are four major Gentile kingdoms in the world. But there really are five Gentile kingdoms mentioned here and we'll show you. And then there's one final kingdom that will last forever. The dream image of a man prophecy is the image of a man, a statue, which you see. He's sideways, but if we were to stand him up, that's what he would look like. And then there's a stone also. And that's the, that's the, the symbols of this dream and then they are explained prophetically uh, and they're not only explained here they are further explained in Daniel chapter number 7 there there are beast images just as you see here they're weird beasts beastly creatures wild beasts there's this weird lion that's got abnormalities and there's a weird bear and a weird leopard and a weird he-goat and more. And all of this is, uh, all of it's weird. It's beasts and it's a dream that's given to Daniel in Daniel chapter number 7. But this dream's given to the king. And it has been suggested by commentaries that Daniel 2 is as man might see these Gentile kingdoms, these Gentile uh, nations, rulers throughout history. Uh, and man sees them as gold and silver and maybe some iron, hard and tough and all of these kinds of things. But God sees them when he gives the dream as wild beasts. Let me say that Gentile, ungodly, Gentile rule is as wicked as a vicious wild beast. And even to this day we see that it's so. Wild beast. And that's how God sees them. So let's try to cover the four points that you have on the back of your paper. Four points, okay? First, there is the problem. In verse 1 through 13, we have a problem. We have a problem for the king. We have a problem for the king's advisors. The ungodly Babylonian king receives a dream from God. And I note that it says dreams, plural. That tells me that it was a reoccurring dream. It continued to come to him. And the king it said in verse number one, he, it says, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. 
He's troubled in his heart, in his soul. He, uh, he couldn't sleep because of it. Verse 3 goes on and the king said, My spirit was troubled to know the dream. Troubled to know the dream. I looked up that word troubled to try to see what it says. And I found it in the book of Judges. And it described uh, over there Samson. And it said, Judges 13, 25, it said, The Spirit of the Lord began to move him. To move him is the same word, troubled. To move him. And I thought to myself, just like the Spirit of God was troubling and moving and stirring Samson back then, God Almighty is stirring this pagan king, heathen king, through a dream. Troubling his soul. Peace is taken from him. He can't even rest. It's got him so troubled. It's got him so wound up that he tells the men who come, his advisors, if you don't figure this out, I'm killing you and I'm going to make your house into a compost pile. That's what the, I'd say this thing's eating away at him. When you... <laughs> he's troubled. About the future. The Bible says, look at verse number 28, uh, verse 29 of the passage. It, it, he said, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? He's concerned about the future. He's concerned about uh, his future, apparently. I wonder, have that. What, what I get here is a great picture of how the Spirit of God will trouble a soul about their future and about what the future holds for them. And they don't, can't put the pieces of the puzzle together. They can't figure it out. They, and they're wanting somebody to help them to figure it out. Right? And lo and behold, this king doesn't have any better sense but to call the wrong people. To give him the answer. Which is also typical of the unconverted world. The unsaved. The inevitably. Uh, calling st astrologers. Miss Barb. Calling astrologers to come and try to give some answers. Uh, Miss Barb has recently testified. Listen. Oh, he's in a fix. The problem for the king. There's a problem. For the king. He's troubled. Have you ever been troubled? You ever been saved? You've been troubled. And God began. The spirit of God began to move on you. And you got troubled about your future. About facing God one of these days. And about after death. And what life, what's it going to be? That's the Spirit of God's work. John 16 and 8 said, When He comes, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He will convince us of sin. He convinces us of our sin. He convinces us that judgment's coming. Right? The Holy Spirit will come and deal with your heart, reprove you and say, You have been wrong. We'll let you know. Let, pull back your heart and let you see what you really are. We call it conviction. The preparatory work of God before bringing you to the Lord Jesus Christ so you can be saved. So, the problem for the king. Then, the problem for the king turns into a problem for the king's advisors. Verse 5 and 6, he told them to come up with an answer or he was going to chop them up. He's not just going to kill them, he's going to chop them into pieces, he said. And then I'm going to make your house an outhouse in the country. That's, and then verse 10 to 12, the wise men tell the king, uh, man can't show you these dreams. Man can't show you. They, they have discovered that they had back in that day some kind of a, a book that had emblems and symbols and, and had the capacity to interpret dreams by using those symbols and come up with that. Well, so they're begging, they're begging the king to give an answer. Give me some kind of answer or uh, 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 some kind of uh, 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 um, tell us, tell us the dream. Some kind of hint. Give us a hint. 
And he said, I'm not telling you anything. You're just strolling for time. That's what you're up to. <laughs> so they didn't have, they couldn't go to their little book of symbols and say, oh, well, yeah, this means that. And this means that. And this means that. So they're left and they say, only God can do what you're requiring of us. <laughs> man can't do that. How's man going to figure out this stuff? We don't even know the dream. You don't want him to tell us. And I don't know whether the king knew it or not, but he, he told them that he didn't, that he didn't even remember it. I don't know. He might have remembered it and just tried to. I don't know. He sure remembered it when Daniel told him. Didn't he? So there's a problem for the uh, king's advisors. And having said that, now there's an announcement in the chapter to kill them. He commanded they be killed, all of them. I mean, this thing's eating his lunch. And the bad news is that the text says, verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. You know why? Because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also king's advisors. They haven't even been involved in this thing. And now all of a sudden they're notified. Your head's on the chopping block. Right? So there's the problem. First 13 verses. Problems for the king. Problem for the king's advisors. Secondly, I see the problem solver. In verse 14 through 30. God is the problem solver. It was God who gives boldness, who gave boldness for Daniel to make appeal to the executioner. He goes to the executioner and he said, well, certainly, oh, well, I have a little time. And the executioner, of course, would have said, no, you don't have any time. He's already said they're stalling for time. They're not asked for time. <laughs> but he goes, to, can you imagine going to the executioner? To make an appeal. Let, let me come up with an answer here. It was God who gave boldness to Daniel uh, to go into the angry king and ask for time. He then goes into the angry king and asks for time. When the king had just told them there's not going to be any time. It was God who gave Daniel faith to then promise the king an answer when Daniel didn't yet have one. It was God who gave the king a heart to accept Daniel's appeal for time. It was God who gave answer to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's prayers. Immediately whenever he leaves the king, he gets up Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they get together and they pray. In verse number 17, he gathers them together and they have a prayer meeting. Fellas, our head's on the chopping block. We got to get to God. We, we, we got to have some answers. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a terrible thing. It's a frightening thing, but it's a wonderful thing when you finally get to the place. You got to have something from God or, or it's over. When you can do nothing but trust God. And that's where they came to. And God reveals the truth to them and gives them answer. And immediately start praising God. You ought to praise Him whenever God answers your prayers. Praise Him. God gives insight. God gives the interpretation. Verse 17 through 19. There's one or two things you can do in a crisis. You can panic or pray. Or I guess I would say you can do both. <laughs> when you panic... <laughs> Pray. Get to God until the Lord can do something for you and answer your prayers. He's the problem solver. He's the insight giver. He's the wisdom giver. He's the problem solver. He's the one who has power to change everything. He does.
verse 24 through 30, Daniel goes to the king with answers from God. He tells him the true God is the problem solver. He says, he begins in verse 27 there. He says, uh, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers show unto the king. He's not asking a question. He's making a statement. He, he's saying, man can't do this. Verse 28. You ought to underline that. Or highlight it. You got a highlighter? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king what shall be in the latter days. He's the one who's going to give you what you need to understand about this dream. Man can't fix the problem, but there is a great problem solver. His name is the true and living God. He's Jehovah. He's Elohim. He's New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth number three, the prophecy. We come to the prophecy. See, we got through that first 30 verses pretty fast, didn't we? Verse 31, the prophecy. Verse 31 through 45. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is about future events. He said, he's made known what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon the... Verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets make no, maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. God foretells the future. God predicts the future. It's unbelievable. Daniel then begins to tell the dream. He tells the dream that the king has had and the king has not shown just not even one little hint of what the dream is. And all of a sudden, Daniel says, here's the dream. And he starts laying it out, starts laying the dream out just precisely, just exactly like King Nebuchadnezzar saw it just exactly like he remembered it just exactly can you imagine King Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> Gary opens his mouth just gaping like <laughs> how'd you know that nobody else has been able to tell him I'm not even sure that he's been able to remember it up to this point but God is revealing this prophet, prophecy. Uh, just, uh, would that blow your mind? Sure it would. Verse 31 to 35, he tells the dream. Verse 36 to 45, he interprets the dream. He gives the meaning of the dream. God is the problem solver. He's the God who predicts future Gentile rulers and nations over in Isaiah he predicted the meeting Persian ruler by name before he ever came to pass came into this world he gave dream to the Babylonian king interpretation to Daniel he sets the course of history he gives prophecy about the course of history the theme of the book is that God is on the throne ruling and overruling everything. And so it's no big deal for him to say, here's how it's going to unfold for the next few, even thousands of years. And give specific. This God-given statue tells us of a special Gentile special Gentile kingdoms and then it tells us of the superiority of the Lord Jesus' kingdom. The statue image of this man 
has to do with Gentile world powers over Israel. The Gentile rule over Israel is described in our New Testament in Luke chapter number 21 verse 24. Listen to what it said. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of who? The Gentiles. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What's the times of the Gentiles? It's Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. It is these predicted Gentile powers that are going to rule over Jerusalem for extended period of time. Technically, they're still Gentile world powers ruling over Jerusalem. You say, oh no, it's not so, it's not so. How come there's a mosque where the temple's supposed to be? Today. And all of that's going to happen until Jesus Christ comes back, the stone comes back and demolishes Gentile world power. And sets up Israel again. Ruling out of Jerusalem. I could take a, down, a run down the road of the preterist, but I better not yet. We're already covering a lot of ground tonight. The image tells us of four Gentile kingdoms ruling maybe five maybe six no 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 maybe five look you, you've got them I've listed them for you see them on the back of your paper the Babylonian Empire was from 605 BC to 539 BC that's found in verse number 37 and 38 the Medo-Persian Empire found in verse number 39 the first half is 539 BC to 331 BC the Grecian Empire is 39 B.C. Oh no, verse 39 B, excuse me. And then it's 321 B.C. to 63 B.C. Alexander the Great period. And then the Roman Empire, 63 B.C. through A.D. 70. Uh, and then, of course, Roman rule really declined on down in church history. Uh, but that's verse number 40. And then there is a fifth kingdom here. There are, there's much reference to them more than reference to the others. And that is the two feet ten toe period. It is mentioned verse 41 through 43. Not just a half a verse, not just a whole verse, not, but it's 41 to 43. It talks about these ten toe portion of what comes out of a Roman Empire. The fourth is the Roman Empire, right? <laughs> so then you don't know. <laughs> Nobody think nobody's gonna agree with me anyway. Wait, it, it, listen, we're we're bumping through this one. We'll get more detail. I'm going I'm to give you some verses still, even before we close. But we'll get more detail when we get to Daniel 7. Okay? All right, Brother Kurt. Hey, man. So, so we'll get there. But I'm just, I, you're just going to have to swallow what I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so I can tell you. So the fifth is, is Rome is to be revived with a Rome type rule is to be revived with a ten nation confederacy represented by the ten toe portion just before the second coming of Christ. Out of the Roman Empire will come a beast in Daniel 7 that has ten horns 
not ten toes but this is it's same image same truth ten horns and another little horn and horns are kings over kingdoms they're rulers over empires let me let me help you De Daniel 8 verse 20 and 21 Daniel 8 20 and 21 we can use, look at numerous passages that illustrate or define that for us that horns are for uh, representing kings over kingdoms where, where we at Daniel 8 20 and 21 the ram which thou sawest have two horns and the kings of Media and Persia see you, you didn't know this was Media Persia kingdom that that second kingdom did you but we read it in Daniel 7 specifically we're told about it and the rough goat is the king of Grisha and Greece is next see and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king horns a king right let me give you a passage in Revelation 17 12 which further defines it and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings See, that's pretty plain, isn't it? The horn symbol in this prophetic truth in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and in Revelation, the book of the Revelation, those horns are kings. There's a ten-nation confederacy that's going to hook up with Antichrist, the book of the Revelation says. And they're going to war in the last days and rule but thank God there's a great stone not cut out with man's hands who's going to come and whenever he comes we're told that he's going to come and that big stone is thrown right at the head of Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold no. It's thrown at the feet. And the feet are hit. And the toes. Right? Are you still with me? Um... Look at verse number 41, 42, 44 of Daniel 2. It says, uh, And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes part of uh, potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed. Look at verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. Look at verse number 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his what? Feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay and the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The Lord Jesus is going to become like a great mountain. That stone is going to tear up Gentile world power when he comes. And he's going to then take over the whole earth. Having said all of that, let me say that even Daniel and in his interpretation back here doesn't have full light about all that's being said. He does understand certainly about the four kingdoms that are coming. And uh, well, I don't know exactly all together about all of them, but uh, the whole point is we then in New Testament have greater revelation about what that means. 
That's why if you don't watch out, somebody just goes Daniel 2, Daniel 7 and tries to explain things and leaving out the book of the Revelation and its revelation to us and they wind up getting confused because you can come up with all kinds of things because it's not so clear Daniel 2 here, is it? That's why I'm saying we're going to get greater light, more light in Daniel 7. It's because of Daniel 7 that I can tell you that it's the Medes and the Persians and the Grecians and these are the kingdoms. Not Daniel 2. Because Daniel 2 doesn't even define that yet. And here I've been studying all week just to try to be able to get a whole chapter 49 verses preached. And you go... As if the passage isn't difficult enough already without having to try to cram in so much that Brother Steve's saying, oh, you should have done a series on Daniel 2. <laughs> you should have just done a series on Daniel 2. <laughs> no, you're right, brother. You're right. Look, look at a couple of passages here. Um, Revelation chapter number 11. Re Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. And, and the seventh angel sounded the woe judgments, the, the, the what are they, the the seventh angel judge sounded and there was a great voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this world. And they're going to be under Gentile rule. They still are. And they're going to be until Jesus comes. You say, well, what's Gentile rule? Gentile rule is rule specifically over um, Jerusalem and Israel, Palestine. You say, well, how come you can say that? Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's more precise, and the reason I say that it's precise definition is because Russia area was around back then. China was area was around. India area was around back then. And they had some rule. But the emphasis of Scripture is about Jerusalem and the people of God of Old Testament covenant. See? So that's why it focuses on these Gentile world powers. Where else are we going to look? Where else you want to look? <laughs> Revelation chapter 19. Verse 15 and 16. Speaking of the Lord's return, it said, It says, Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations. That sword is just emblematic of, of him speaking. That's what God does. He can speak things into existence. He can speak judgment. He can speak, right? Like a sword, it will tend to matters. And with it, he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture when he comes on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of of lords. Now look at Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, verse 1, two, 1 through 4 and then verse 9. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. And I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled. And the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth in to captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. 
Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great, very great valley. And half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north and half of it toward the south. Verse 9 says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. One of these days he's coming back. And all of these hot dog politicians, uh, it's over for them. Strutting around, packing their bank accounts at everybody else's cost, trying to rule the world. And the big billionaire or a bunch of them that are funding it all. One of these days, the Lord's going to come back and He's going to just knock the snot out of them. And He's going to say, we, we talked the other night about the Lord Jesus is the inheritor. You know the Bible says the meek will inherit the earth. It says we're going to inherit it. We're joint heirs. That means we're going to get it too. We're, we're already told who's going to sit on thrones over there in Jerusalem. Right? You say, I just don't believe any of that nonsense. Well, just you're an unbeliever. Jesus said it, and he's been right about everything up to this point, so I'm just going to go ahead and believe him for the rest of it. I noticed that the image, this image of Daniel 2, doesn't get more valuable. It gets less valuable. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. Starts with a head of gold. And then the breast and the arms are of silver. And verse 39 says about the breast and the arms, it says, And after thee, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And you know they just keep getting inferior? The belly and thighs of brass are less valuable. The legs of iron are less. Is, is iron less valuable than gold? Less valuable than silver? The feet part of iron and part of clay? What kind of value is it? Oh, dirt. That's totally contrary to evolutionary theory. The post millennialist used to believe, used to believe I say, because there ain't very many of them around anymore. They used to preach that the church was bringing in the kingdom. And from the time that Jesus came, it's just going to get better and better and better and better. And we're going to have a spiritual revival on the planet. The only problem is that's not how it's worked out. So they've had to abandon their ideology about post-millennialism. Because the Bible says... Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. What, what are the kingdoms going to be? They're going to become worse and worse. Who, who ever seen such a bunch of foolish people trying to run the world as we're seeing today? told the ten kingdoms are going to come together we could talk about those ten kingdoms there's all right all kind of ten kingdom stuff going on on the planet but those ten are going to try to get together you know what they are 
iron. They're going to rule hard. They're going to, like Rome did. And yet they're going to have a bunch of clay. And let me tell you, it's going to be a mixed up deal. And it won't hold together very well. The ten confederate nation that's uh, Gentile power that's going to be before the Lord comes, isn't, it's going to be hard just to keep it together. I think it says some of them are going to get booted out, doesn't it? Down to seven. But can you imagine trying to get it all to jail and get it all to work? That's what we're doing. What we're doing, and we're seeing this, this, uh, I don't know what stage we're at, I don't know where we're at, but I'll tell you this much, we're seeing an effort globally to try to make a global system and trying to get it to stick together. Can you imagine trying to get Russia and China and the United States and Germany and try to get the UK and try, try to get everybody just get together and let's see if we can make it stick. Man, we're going man, we're gonna make this thing work. We're gonna we're we're gonna go with the program. We'll call this program global warming and everybody will get on board and we'll have green energy and we're gonna everybody's gonna make a lot of money and all us power people are gonna make money and our countries are gonna make money. Yeah, I wonder how that's going to work out. And let's just keep throwing out viruses so we can keep churches closed. Close them back down again. And it'd be good if somehow, some way, we just take kids out of school for a few years so they'd be idiotic. They don't even know nothing, so they just wind up be, just believing whatever they saw online, which is 90% propaganda junk. It's not even true. Second law of thermodynamics are operating right now. You know what that means? Everything's decaying. Me and Brother Kurt's decaying, aren't we? Now, Judy and Diana, they're doing all right, but we're decaying. Everything's deteriorating. It's scientifically true. It's the world we're in. Well, let me tell you, governments are decaying as well. We better stop somewhere, hadn't we? Look, look at Matthew 21, 44. Matthew 21, 44. Uh, let's start verse 42. Jesus said unto them, it's when the Lord Jesus is on earth, it says, Didn't, did you never read in the scriptures the stone? See, this stone of Daniel 2 is the Lord Jesus. Right? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth uh, the fruits thereof. And then verse 44, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. If you fall on this stone, you're going to be broken. But this is not a bad breaking because you got to get broke to get right. Fall on the, fall on the, on the, the Lord Jesus. Let him break you and remake you. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That reminds me of verse 35 of Daniel 2. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the golden broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and so on. Chaff. You know what chaff is? It's just like 
whenever Ron Gary out there and they're combining or something and all that dust that's just floating around that's that they've already got the corn in but the dust is just everywhere and it's just the wind just blowing it's nothing it's just it's nothing chaff the little you know. so what the Lord said about these Gentile powers they're just you're going to take care of them break them disperse them They'll be meaningless to him. Because it would never come to him. What's all this tell us? God can tell the future. He knows your future. He knows your... Let me ask you this. Do you know your future? The Bible says, 1 John chapter 5, we can know our future. These things have we written that you may know that you have eternal life. We can know, can't we? The problem, the problem solver, the prophecy, and then the promotion, verse 46 through 49. The last part of the chapter, which we did not read, let's read it. We'll be finished tonight. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and what happens? He gives Daniel great respect and great responsibility. Verse 46 and 47, he gives great respect. He fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered, that, you know what that is? That's just the pagan doing what a pagan thinks he's supposed to do when something that God, that's so evident that God was in it, that that's just how they do he doesn't get saved here but let me tell you he's gained a respect for Daniel like he's never had before he already had respect but now he's really got it doesn't he he said of a truth it is that your God is a God capital G of God small g he's 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 still polytheistic, believes all kinds of gods. And so I'm telling you, this one's your God, Daniel's superior. And Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou could reveal this secret. Then, great responsibilities given to him. It said, then the king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. I couldn't help but laugh whenever I read that. Can you imagine this? This young Jewish upstart who's just been brought into the kingdom one of the enemy <laughs> and all of these wise men the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and the astrologers and those who've been in the pecking order for a long time and all of a sudden the king said to a teenager Daniel, be equivalent to us in our day, in our country. You're vice president. <laughs> I've got a sneaking suspicion. These boys are mad. You, you do remember next chapter, we're coming to it. That Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were turned in because they weren't standing. I mean, because they wouldn't kneel, because they stood. You do remember Daniel chapter number 6, whenever Daniel is praying, somebody's deliberately setting him up. They hate. 
because the king likes them and because God has promoted them. And then I love this as well. Verse 49. Then Daniel requested of the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Daniel wanted his brethren to also be promoted. Oh, it's wonderful whenever when people want others to be promoted. Not just self, but others. And, and that was the heart of Daniel. But it says, verse 40, But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. That means he's a big muckety-muck. Doesn't it? He's the man. He's a big muckety-muck in the kingdom. There we have the prod prophetic dream about the times of the Gentiles and about Gentile kingdoms that are going to rule in days to come in generations to come foretold by God we look back on it and we see four kingdoms that have already been those prophecies have been fulfilled for them but there's still a kingdom coming, a Gentile kingdom coming, that has not yet occurred yet. The Antichrist system, book of the Revelation. And then there is, of course, the forever kingdom of the Son of God. Somebody says, oh, well, it says just a thousand years in Revelation. Yep, but it also said in Revelation, that passage I read in Revelation chapter 11, where it said that his kingdom would be forever. Hey, there, there's no big deal for him to be go for a thousand years and then just go on forever after a thousand years, is there? That's still a kingdom that's forever. <laughs> He's always and ever going to be on the throne when he comes. I mean, visible. And everybody will know it. Forever. Let's stand. Father, thank you for this portion of the word. We pray that, uh, Lord, we'll be able to chew on it, not only chew on it, but get it. Uh, you're the revealer of secrets. You revealed secrets to King Nebuchadnezzar. You revealed secrets to Daniel. Lord, you could reveal secrets to us. Lord, we would not only think about the re revealing of secrets, but revealing the futures. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help hearts somebody maybe in our midst many several even that don't know you I, I pray that you'll bring this troubling like uh, Nebuchadnezzar experienced a troubling not necessarily a dream or something but just a concern for uh, their future I pray there'll be a troubling that will bring them to the place that they'll seek you for real answers not the wrong places not wrong religion Lord not a bunch of uh, folks who are just fortune tellers and stuff like that that don't get it right but one who's absolutely reliable you're our creator you can convert us and change us and all that but confirm in our hearts that we're going to heaven after we die you said so 1 John 5 these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life pray you'll confirm it in some souls tonight even is our prayer in Jesus name we pray amen